Breath of the Wild's Hyrule hides a number of secrets. The world is populated by ruins, abandoned towns, castles, farms, homes, and notably, statues. Ancient statues of the goddess Hylia can be found across Hyrule. One in every major settlement, as well as places of religious significance like the Temple of Time or the Goddess Springs. These statues vary from just a few feet tall to colossal stone titans which dwarf Link, but all of them show their age, with worn edges and the creeping growth of greenery. But just outside the bustling Hateno village, away from the busy sounds of life and civilization, lurks another goddess statue. A statue so pointedly ignored by the people of the village that they refuse to even wipe the bird droppings from it. A statue with a dark past, the Horned Statue. A child from Hateno Village can show Link to the Horned Statue, found a short distance outside of the main settlement, down a small path. At first glance it appears to be another goddess statue, nestled closely to the side of the hill, with the face and wings of Hylia. But when we look closer, we can see twisted horns atop its head, a head which features sunken, sinister eyes. The horn statue is surprised that Link is able to hear it. Similar to how the goddess statues seem to be able to communicate telepathically with Link, so too can the horned statue. Though in place of the benevolent grace of the goddess Hylia's voice, the horned statue speaks in cruel, mocking tones. And while divine light from the heavens shines down on the statues of Hylia, eerie light enshrouded in black fog emanates from the ground surrounding the horned statue. The statue describes itself as once being a dealer in life and power, who traded the souls of mortals for rupees, a merchant of life and money. However, these Faustian deals, swapping life for money, angered the goddess Hylia leading to the entity being sealed in a stone statue not unlike the goddess statues built in honour of the deity. When Link first finds the statue, without his consent it will steal a heart container from him. Like a reversal of the process through which Sheikah monks bestow spirit orbs, the statue is able to tear part of Link's life essence from him. If Link talks to the statue again, he learns that the being will return the stolen essence in the form of either a heart container or a stamina vessel. After this first swap, the statue will buy containers from Link for 100 rupees, and then sell back the essence in either form for 120 rupees, gaining 20 rupees for itself for every transaction. So, aside from being incredibly useful to Link, the Horn statue is interesting because of his backstory, shrouded in mystery. Who was this strange being, a dealer in life and money, whose bargaining resulted in eternal imprisonment in a twisted goddess statue? Is the spirit within truly malevolent or just misunderstood, and have we seen it before in the series? Upon meeting the Horn statue when I first played Breath of the Wild, his malicious, cruel manner of speaking, coupled with his usefulness, immediately reminded me of another character in the series, the Mad Batter. The Mad Batter appears in both A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening, found in a single cave in Hyrule in the former, and multiple across Koholint in the latter. The Mad Batter is a demon, apparently in the depths of a dark slumber when Link encounters him. Awakening the batter from this slumber will result in him cursing Link, which in actuality is in all instances a straightforward buff, allowing Link to carry more of various items, such as doubling his magic meter, bomb bag, or quiver. While the Mad Batter's seemingly villainous appearance and tone, coupled with the supposed curses working to Link's advantage, are similar to those traits in Breath of the Wild's horned statue, I think it'd be a stretch to connect the two. The Mad Batter is, well, mad, contradicting himself and talking in crazed sentences. The Horned Statue, on the other hand, perhaps more terrifyingly, appears to be perfectly sane, despite years of imprisonment within the statue. But the Mad Batter isn't the only character we've seen throughout the series who's similar to this sinister statue. This connection between life and wealth is a recurring theme in the series, the most notable example of which is Giovanni. Twilight Princess's Giovanni is one of the most tragic characters in the series. 
Once a respected man with a home, a cat, and a girlfriend, Giovanni was overcome by greed. His insatiable lust for wealth caused him to sell his soul to a dark creature, providing him with unimaginable riches, mountains of gold, crowns, chests, and jewels. But as is often the case in stories, there was a catch. By selling his soul, Giovanni was turned to gold, unable to move from the throne on which he sat, unable to visit his girlfriend, or even remove his petrified cat from his head. When Link visits Giovanni, he'll plead for the hero to rescue him, by hunting down the pose which hold the pieces of his soul. If Link slays all 60 imp pose, rescuing all fragments of Giovanni's soul, he'll be returned to his regular form, rewarding Link with as much wealth as he likes. But unfortunately for Giovanni, his troubles aren't over. After being freed, he'll move to Telma's bar for the rest of the game, weeping because his girlfriend has left him for another man. While Giovanni's soul is held by 60 imp pose across Hyrule, he mentions to Link that he sold his soul to a singular dark creature. A dark creature who will buy souls for money. Sounds a lot like the horned statue of Hateno Village. And this is similar to a peril found in Ocarina of Time's Kakariko Village, where an entire family has been cursed in a similar way to Giovanni, known as the Spider's Curse. An old man in Kakariko will tell Link of a fabulously rich family in the village, who were cursed due to their greed. Link can venture into the House of Skulltula, a run-down, decaying house choked by cobwebs, and meet the cursed family, a father and five sons who have all been transformed into twisted, chimeric spiders. Similarly to Giovanni's curse, the spider's curse can be broken by hunting down the gold sculptures across Hyrule, freeing the family and again rewarding Link with unlimited wealth. So it's clear that throughout Hyrule's history, beings who have claimed the souls of greedy individuals have existed. The dark creature which cursed Giovanni, and whoever was responsible for the spider's curse in Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask might even be the same entity, a twisted, malevolent being which curses those that seek wealth at the cost of their humanity. But despite the seemingly evil nature of the statue, it doesn't seem that it's truly dangerous. If Link visits the Great Deku Tree after completing a number of shrines, but still doesn't have more than the 13 heart containers needed to pull the Master Sword from its pedestal, the Great Deku Tree will say the following. Perhaps you imagine that the containers given to you by the statues of the goddess cannot be changed. Visit Hateno Village in the southeast of Hyrule. There you will find one who trades in such containers. Though, he is a bit wicked. The Great Deku Tree sacred guardian deity of the forest, explicitly recommends that Link visits the statue. If whatever was sealed within the statue was truly evil, a being similar to Demise, Ganon, Varty, or some other terror, it wouldn't seem fitting for the great Deku Tree to advise Link to seek his services. Instead, it seems that the Deku Tree knows something that we don't about the statue, laughing that he's a bit wicked, but implying that there's no real threat. Additionally, if Link attempts to trade with the Horn statue beyond his limits, going lower than three hearts or one stamina wheel, the being will reject the trade, warning Link of the adverse effects. Unlike the Spider's Curse, or Giovanni's, it seems that the Horn statue is either unable or unwilling to take the base essence of individuals, which would reduce them to a less than human state. So what could it have originally been? Is it a completely unique character, unrelated to anything we've seen before in the series, whose origins we'll never fully understand? Not exactly. I think that in Breath of the Wild, we actually see a character who is incredibly similar to the being within the statue. If we look at the Japanese version of the game, we get slightly more information on the identity of this cryptic character. Instead of a dealer of life and wealth, the Horn statue refers to itself as a god on more than one occasion, a god who governed life and power. But perhaps more importantly, we also learn that it's able to perform its magical trading by using the power of rupees. Rupees are the currency of the Zelda series, colourful gemstones ranging from the simple green rupee 
all the way up to the magnificent gold, worth 300 of the former. In most games they're found all over the world, in long grass, pots, or as drops from enemies. Breath of the Wild's rupees, however, are comparatively harder to obtain, though they're still used for buying and selling goods from traders. But rupees aren't just currency. We know that these iconic stones actually contain some form of magical power. For example, the magic armor in Twilight Princess and the Wind Waker directly converts rupees into protection, providing Link invulnerability at the cost of his wallet. But interestingly, we see that the magical powers of rupees are used directly by some of Zelda's most powerful beings, the Great Fairies. Great Fairies are found primarily in fairy fountains, sacred pools which ease the pain of wounded travellers and bestow gifts upon the honest. We've seen them in games ever since the original, but they didn't offer gifts until A Link to the Past, where there's a unique fountain known as the Pool of Happiness. Upon visiting this pool, Link is asked if he would like to throw rupees into the water, and for every hundred he throws in, the Queen of Fairies will appear and increase his maximum carrying capacity of bombs or arrows. In Breath of the Wild, fairy fountains take the form of giant floral pods, which imprison a great fairy within. The fairies will explain that once, these fountains were blooming with life, but over time, fewer and fewer travellers visited the fountains to offer rupees. Without rupees, their powers have waned, trapping them inside these buds, and by donating rupees, Link can restore the power of these great fairies, returning them to their original state. So we know that great fairies, especially those in Breath of the Wild, explicitly use rupees to perform their magic, and without them, they're nearly powerless. But the great fairies, while eccentric, don't seem to fit the personality nor the powers of the horned statue. They are closely connected to life, with fairies themselves being able to revive someone from beyond death and are powered by rupees, but they don't make trades between the two, instead just upgrading armor. But Breath of the Wild doesn't only feature the four main great fairies. There's actually a fifth, one of the most interesting characters in the game, Melania, who appears in his own fairy fountain in the Farren region. Melania, like the great fairies, is trapped within a giant bud when Link discovers his fountain, and requires 1,000 rupees in order to regain his power and free himself. But unlike the great fairies, who simply upgrade Link's armor, Melania offers a unique service. He will revive Link's horses if they happen to die, and is fittingly designed with a giant tribal horse mask. His theme is even the fairy fountain theme mixed with Epona's song, and it seems that the stables across Hyrule were all designed to resemble him. As well as obviously being exceptionally powerful, Melania has a strange personality, often violently threatening Link and then claiming he was joking. Melania is interesting because it proves that great fairies aren't limited to the standard form we normally see them in. This horse fairy is a type of great fairy, found in a fountain, requiring rupees to regain his powers, but is unique in his abilities, appearance, and personality. So, could the being trapped within the horned statue have once been another form of great fairy, similar to Melania, a being who, using the power of rupees, traded life and money with travelers, a service which displeased the goddess Hylia, resulting in eternal imprisonment within a statue? The other unique trait about Melania, when compared to the other great fairies in Hyrule, is how he refers to himself. While the standard fairies refer to themselves as great fairies, with Terra in particular calling herself the Great Earth Fairy, Melania refers to himself as the god who watches over the horses of the world. Even Hylians nearby know of him as a god, with Perosa mentioning that the god who can revive horses lives nearby, and the bridge and lake leading to his fountain are named after this. He's not known as a great fairy, he's known as a god. Just like the horn statue in the Japanese version of Breath of the Wild, who not only uses the power of rupees to perform his magic, but refers to himself as a god. Could the true identity of the horned statue be that of a being similar to Melania, a unique form of great fairy who traded life and wealth with those who visited his fountain? 
Melania exhibits a strange personality, with fits of rage and an incredibly protective nature regarding the horses he cares for, unlike anything a great fairy has been shown to have before. Might the horned statue, too, have been a fairy with a unique personality? A cruel, mocking entity using the power of rupees to trade wealth and life with travellers, acts which caused the goddess Hylia to seal him within a statue, trapping him for all eternity. It's impossible to truly know the origins and identity of the horned statue. It's one of the most cryptic characters in a game already full of mysteries and puzzles, but that's what makes it all the more interesting. I think that, based on the evidence, it really could have been a being not dissimilar from Melania, a form of great fairy whose trades caused its imprisonment within the statue. But like many things in Zelda, it's up to you to make up your own mind. Thanks for watching this video. What do you think is the true identity of the horned statue? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys and I'll see you next time.